Hello, everyone. I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library here with Jenny Stapp. It's our time for our website chat this May, and there's actually lots to chat about. So, Jenny, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thanks, Joe. And hi, everyone. I'm very happy to join you middle of May. Um, do you want to advance the slide, Joe? And sure. Then we'll take a look at um, Oops. the list of things that we want to talk about today. I want to do a brief legislative session update. I want to talk a little bit about the American Recovery, actually Rescue Plan Act and um, the State Library's response, as well as some work that we're doing to help Oops, sorry. all of you with that effort. Um, talk a little bit about the Commission and the Network Advisory Council updates and our efforts to continue to advance the Montana Library Network. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some COVID updates, news related to vaccinations, and of course the, the CDC announcement about masking that came out yesterday. Um, if Suzanne is able to join us, I know um, she has some information about E-rate and some of the ARPA funding pertaining to a lot of the, the funding that's available for broadband enhancements. So um, I don't know if Suzanne will be able to join us, but if she does, does, we'll have time on the agenda for her as well. All right, great. Great, so starting with a legislative update, uh, as you've heard me say over the last several months, from a budget perspective, it was a really positive budget session for the State Library. We went into the session with a good looking proposed budget in the state's House Bill 2 overall budget bill. And that held throughout the session. We had some additional one time only monies added to our budget uh, that will help to deploy what's called a real time network, which is a network of GPS repeater stations situated around the state that uh, are used to do things like precision surveying, uh, drive precision agriculture. In the future, they're used to drive autonomous vehicles and that kind of thing. And uh, the State Library uh, has had several partners reach out to us over the years asking us to take the lead on developing one for the state of Montana. And so with this uh, an initial boost of funding, we hope to get that effort launched. Um, our coal severance tax funding, while the coal severance tax funds, the revenue continues to be lower than historical averages. With the passage of House Bill 374, we can now be assured that any revenue shortfalls in that account will be backfilled with state general fund. And so we anticipate having between 90 and $100,000 more to fund the kinds of programs that we typically fund with those dollars. Those include things like the grants to federations, digitization for the Montana Memory Project, some of the training opportunities that Joe makes available for libraries, um, digitization of our state publications, access to professional library development databases and so forth. And so um, this will just make it much, much easier for us to plan and have some assurances in our budget for those kinds of expenditures going forward. And then the two spending bills that you've heard me talk about, House Bills 49 and House Bills 50, which provide additional funding for our digital library services, both passed. They'll help us to uh, restore some of the services that have been on hold for several years because of the budget cuts that we experienced a number of years ago. Um, one of the things we're really, really excited about is to have some funding to help us work directly with local governments and local public safety, safety answering points to help them develop their GIS data to support modern enhanced 911 systems. And so we uh, will plan to uh, start offering those services later this summer. So as I said, overall, a really positive budget session for the State Library and, and we're just really thrilled to be in the position we're in and moving forward. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the ARPA funds uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, I know from a policy perspective, the session um, 
it was a, a different tenor and uh, we saw quite a bit of different activity that impacts libraries related to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the passage of House Bill 102, which um, prevents local governments and a variety of boards from implementing their own policies pertaining to concealed carry and allows concealed carry in a wide variety of settings throughout the state of Montana really the only exceptions to where people can carry concealed weapons are uh, in federal buildings where state laws don't govern, in courtrooms, and then the Montana University system and school districts have the ability to set their own policy, policies under the auspices of House Bill 102. And so that's a pretty significant change for local governments and for library boards who may have traditionally had policies outlawing weapons in libraries. And so our staff are working closely with the Montana Association of Counties to understand what kind of guidance they are going to be sharing with local governments so that we can align our guidance and our training uh, with that guidance for all of you. And you know, one of the concerns that we've heard voiced is how to reassure staff about maintaining safety and the safety of staff in libraries. And that, that's something that we certainly want to address. Um, one of the things I think is really important is to just um, openly discuss the questions and concerns that we have so that uh, we can begin to um, plan for how to address those kinds of circumstances going forward. So more to come on that topic. Jenny, before you move on, um, yep. Beth, Beth Boysen has a comment in the chat. Um, I can read it. The gun legislation is worded such that local government actually can control open carry in their open carry in their buildings if it's a matter of public safety. Yes, the, 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 the open carry laws are separate from the concealed carry laws that are governed by House Bill 102. So open carry is different than concealed carry. Good point, Beth, thanks. And then of course, we've seen a number of updates and, and laws coming out of the session that would prevent uh, libraries from enforcing trespass laws for people in uh, libraries that are unmasked as a result of the pandemic. Um, of course, with, with the um, rollout of the vaccinations and now the new CDC guidelines pertaining to masks, that may become less of an issue. Um, but I know throughout the pandemic when libraries were challenged by people who were not wearing masks in accordance with library mask policies, one remedy was to call law enforcement and to ask law enforcement to enforce trespass laws. The legislature did pass a law outlawing that practice as a result of the, the pandemic. Again, hopefully that overall issue is lessening as we, as we move forward, but be aware of that particular kind of change as well. And then uh, the final legislative update that I wanted to share is the passage of Senate Bill 297. Um, that's a, a pretty exciting piece of legislation. It's the most comprehensive legislation that has ever come out of the Montana legislature to support broadband deployment. It appropriates $275,000, or I'm sorry, $275 million of ARPA funds for deployment of broadband around the state. It sets up a task force within the State Department of Commerce that will be looking at prioritizing areas for deployment. The mechanism that the law puts into place uh, creates an application process where broadband providers apply for funding to deploy broadband in unserved and underserved areas with a priority to deploying fiber broadband, so really terrestrial broadband rather than uh, looking at um, some of the wireless or satellite available broadband. The 
law allows for providers and encourages providers to partner with local governments. Um, they've put in place some matching requirements so that local governments can use some of their ARPA funds that they receive to provide match to incentivize deployment in their communities. Uh, the process for the applications will begin this summer and I believe they hope to have the first round of awards issued by this fall. So they're looking at trying to get this funding deployed very, very rapidly around the state. So I know some libraries are already in communication with their local governments, uh, looking at what communities are thinking about in terms of how to use this opportunity to better deploy broadband in their communities um, we're happy to help assist and provide more information and guidance on how libraries might engage with their local governments on these particular kinds of issues. So uh, do let us know if we can help in that, that regard. And I encourage all of you to pay attention to those kinds of conversations that may be happening in your communities. Does anybody have any questions or was there anything that came out of the session that we that I didn't address that you may have questions about. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the American Rescue Plan Act and the funding that's come to the State Library and then the funding that's available through the state. Um, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services under our Library Services and Technology Act, Montana will receive $2.23 million. And under House Bill, two, uh, House Bill 632, which was passed by the legislature, um, we've been directed to spend those monies on two major priorities. One is to continue the hotspot lending program and to encourage more uh, broadband investment for internal wiring within libraries. So with the funding that's available through ARPA, we know we can continue the hotspot lending program at least through December of 2022. So a little bit more than 18 months from now. Uh, in addition to just continuing the program, we hope to be able to expand the program into those counties that are not currently being served by the program and to expand the number of hotspots where there may be need in existing uh, communities. So staff will be working on uh, rolling out those new hotspots in new areas over the coming months. And then we're working with the Lewistown Public Library and the Wedsworth Library in um, Cascade, uh, as well as with the Great Falls Public Library to test a pilot using new technologies to improve the internal wiring and routers and managed broadband services within libraries to help libraries better manage their broadband access and to make sure that the internal wiring within libraries is not a bottleneck for expanded broadband access in the future. Um, that pilot is underway right now. We hope to deploy the internal wiring in the next several weeks so that we have more information about what this pilot might look like uh, as soon as we can in the upcoming fiscal year. And then uh, there should be uh, we're, we're estimating around $700,000 in ARPA funds that would allow us to push this kind of program into other libraries around the state. So uh, we're really excited about the prospects of that program moving forward. A lot more information to come from Tracy and Suzanne as we move forward in the next several months. There's a question in the chat. And Susie, if, if your mic is available, maybe you can just speak here. Jump in. Um, yeah, I, I, I have some confusion with the um, state um, money. They say that the project areas must be described on a shapefile basis, and then they say what the shapefile is. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> how, how would one work with one's community to create one of those? Is that like a common well, GIS thing? Yes. So a shapefile is just a data format that's used in GIS software. So it, it um, if, if um, a community were to say, you know, we want to deploy broadband within the um, legal limits of the, of the city of Great Falls or Cascade County or these school districts or uh, what, whatever geographic extent they may be talking about. Um, using GIS software, we draw a boundary around that geographic extent and save it as a shapefile. So a shapefile is a data format for GIS services. Most of those kinds of boundaries that I just described, um, city, uh, city limits, county boundaries, school district boundaries, library district boundaries, we have mapped at the state library. So if you need that data in a shape file, we can provide it for you. And do you have the data of the broadband coverage? Because we're, it, it's really confusing to us to try to, because um, we have heard that like there's stuff on the FCC website and there's stuff out generally, but we have heard anecdotally that that is not particularly accurate when you compare it to what people are actually experiencing. Great question, Susie. Yeah, yeah. so um, the availability of a broadband map is one of the biggest barriers that Montana faces in deploying these funds. And the State Library is working with the Department of Commerce to propose a, a solution to help address that. It's going to take some time and some investment to get to a granular enough level of detail to really satisfy what the Department of Commerce is looking for. The best source of data is the data that's available through the Federal Communications Commission. All internet service providers are required to submit to the FCC broadband service data on a form that's called a, a Form 477. What's challenging about that is that the Form 477 requires providers to submit data at a census block level, uh, which is a, a geographic extent. In Montana, a census block can be as big as two square miles, so quite a large area. And if even a single household in that census block is served by broadband, it the map shows that the entire census block is served. And we know that that's not the case. So um, that is a challenge for us. Um, that's the best available data we have uh, for kind of a statewide coverage. Uh, we at the State Library have broadband availability data for libraries. Uh, we have access to data from Education Superhighway about broadband availability to schools. Uh, we work with the State Information Technology Services Division to know what broadband is available at state offices and state facilities. Um, so we can map some of that data that will at least give jurisdictions an idea of what broadband deployment currently looks like. But as I said, knowing that is, is the biggest barrier that, that we face in deploying these dollars. Great. So what I'm hearing is that we probably, on a local level, don't need to invest a lot of money into trying to figure that out if you are trying to do that on the state level. I would, I would not invest a lot of money. Um, there may be a need to do some outreach with local governments to encourage people to do speed testing and that kind of thing, um, but we would like to aggregate that to a statewide level. That's a great discussion. Jenny, yeah. the um, FCC information, um, do you know where to find that? I could I could put a link into the um, yeah. event information for today's chat. 
just as a reference for people so uh, they could find it if not right now but later would right, be great try like it's like broadband.gov i think something something really simple like that my my screens are a little messed up at the moment so i can't actually do an internet search without um messing up what, up. what everybody see. sees yeah so yeah. but i but i'll what i'll tell we'll just say that we'll find that and i'll post it to aspen um for today's oh thank you kara yeah. <laughs> she's so helpful um she's it's in the chat yeah. box right now and mm -hmm. i will i will post it to today's event so you can um anyone who might be watching the recording just go to aspen on may 14th and you can find the post under today's chat event listing and as I said, we, we are actually right now drafting a proposal to the Department of Commerce about how either the State Library or we feel Department of Commerce should invest in broadband mapping. And we plan to have that proposal developed by the end of next week. So I'm happy to share that proposal with all of you when it's ready. It has a lot of links to some of the available data that I just mentioned. Okay, where was I? Well, I was talking about ARPA funds. And so the first priority, hot, continuing the hotspot lending program, and then um, being able to invest in the internal wiring in libraries. Um, we're estimating that the cost for the internal wiring is going to be somewhere 20 to $30,000 per library. And as I said, we think we'll probably have around $700,000, at least initially, to put towards that effort. So that's a significant number of libraries that we hope to be able to help uh, improve their internal connections over the next 18 months or so. The balance, the $1 million is intended to go to improving and increasing access to digital content for e-learning. And we had a great discussion with the Network Advisory Council last week about how we might prioritize some of that funding. Uh, in addition to some of the more traditional e-content that we provide like uh, e-books and e-audio, uh, one of the things that we would like to invest in is more Montana specific content through the Montana Memory Project. And so the Network Advisory Council recommended that we prioritize investment in staffing and support for the Montana Memory Project, and um, hopefully some dollars to actually do some digitization. There's about 12 counties in Montana that currently don't have any collections in the Montana Memory Project. And so we would love, for example, to see uh, us be able to develop more content from those counties so that the entire state is represented within the Montana Memory Project. Uh, and then of course we know that there are a wide variety of other needs um, to support digital content, to support e-learning. Uh, this brings me to the next topic on our agenda, talking about the Network Advisory Council and our, our move to launch the Montana Library Network. Um, I'm gonna, Pause briefly. Oh, before I get there, though, sorry. I did want to mention one more thing about ARPA funds. Oh, we have put in a request with the State Procurement Bureau to allow us to contract through a sole source with the Montana Association of Developer, M M A D C. somebody help me. Trace, um, Susie, who does Tracy McIntyre work for? Montana Association of something. Anyway, it's a statewide association of de de development groups within the state of Montana that support economic development. Our intent is to contract with them to help libraries evaluate how you might be able to take advantage of some of the ARPA funds that are being um, distributed to your communities. So the intent behind the agreement, thank you, the Montana Cooperative Development Center. Um, through this contract, they will uh, have they will host drop-in sessions with libraries to help us brainstorm funding opportunities that could be funded through ARPA dollars 
to make sure that the, the proposals that we're considering align with the requirements for ARPA dollars. And then they'll be available to help libraries review and develop uh, either grant proposals or other kinds of proposals to both local governments as well as to the state of Montana to take advantage of some of the ARPA funds that are available um, both locally and at the state level. So we're waiting to hear back from state procurement now and hope to be able to get that contract in place in the next week or so, so that we can get those kinds of activities underway as soon as possible. I know your local communities are already in discussions about how to spend the ARPA dollars locally. Those ARPA dollars that are available through the state, uh, will the state will start accepting applications for uh, those dollars middle of July uh, and start making awards available in October. And one of the priorities for funding is capital improvements. And so we're really interested to know what funding might be available for capital improvements in libraries. And we hope that this opportunity to partner with the MCDC is a way to help libraries take advantage of those dollars. So more to come there. Okay, let me switch gears a little bit. And I wanted to, to spend some time talking about the rollout of the Montana Library Network and the seating of the new Network Advisory Council. At the commission's April meeting, the commission approved a slate of new uh, Network Advisory Council members. Uh, as we've talked about in recent meetings, the we're moving away from a, a broad representative model of the Network Advisory Council to a, a much more, a smaller focused, more, more flexible committee structure and one that's gonna be directly focused on uh, overseeing and helping to advance the concepts of the, the Montana Library Network. So I wanted to share with you the slate of um, new Network Advisory Council members. I just need to bring this up here really quick. I can probably find it. So let me give me, I actually have access to the internet. Got it worked out now. So give me a second. I'll find it. Oh, thanks. I'll let you drop it in the link. I, I just had to. I... So we have nine new members. And the way this the commission set up the structure of the committee, uh, they will serve in staggered terms to start. So Hanor Bray from Missoula, Lori Roberts from Dillon, and Mark Weatherington from the Bitterit will serve an initial one-year term. Sean Anderson from Imagine If, Susie McIntyre from Great Falls, and Doralyn Rossman from MSU will serve for two years. And then Aaron Laframboy uh, from the Medicine Spring Library in Browning, Jody Moore from Red Lodge, and Jonna Underwood from Sheridan County in Plenty, Plentywood uh, will serve for three years. We had an initial meeting with them as well as with the outgoing members of the Network Advisory Council last week. And as I mentioned, they helped us to, to think about some of the initial prioritization of the ARPA funds. Uh, they will begin their work over the summer in helping us to uh, really finalize the list of core services that we've been talking about under the umbrella of the Montana Library Network, including things like a shared management platform, e-resources, uh, resource sharing, uh, cultural services under the, the Montana Memory Project, uh, collection development and, and several others and potentially more, potentially less. Uh, we really want the Network Advisory Council to advise us on what those core services should look like. Um, a, a member of the, the NAC recently proposed that we uh, go back and reevaluate the need for cooperative reference services, for example. Um, each of these core service areas is going to have a committee 
that will help advise the Network Advisory Council and our staff on what those core services should look like, the impact each service is intended to have, and um, how we evaluate the success of those services, the barriers that exist that prevent libraries from either taking advantage of those services or to fully deploying them in their communities uh, and that kind of, of work. Um, later this year, as the, the NAC works to finalize that list of core services, we'll be doing uh, an effort to encourage volunteers for all of those committees. Uh, but we have three specific services that have more immediate needs. And so we're encouraging people to volunteer to serve on committees that will help advise us on the e-resources investments, a shared management platform, and um, the resource sharing services. As I mentioned, we have about a million dollars to invest in digital content. And so the e-resources committee will be focused on uh, advising us on how best to invest those monies. A shared management committee uh, will help advise the state library on an RFP for the platform for the Montana Shared Catalog. And I wanna make sure and emphasize here that uh, while the, the initial work focus for a shared management committee is focused on that platform. We want people who are um, members of the shared catalog as well as librarians and library staff that are um, not necessarily members of the shared catalog because we want to make sure that as we're thinking about the future platform that it can serve all libraries needs, not just the needs of the current members of the shared catalog. And then the resource sharing committee um, one of the, the more immediate needs is to help us evaluate the courier service. We've done an RFI and have some information about uh, a statewide courier program. Uh, we know that the current courier is uh, in, in many ways less than adequate and we want uh, some people that can help advise us on uh, what a more adequate service would look like and how we can uh, better invest in order to support the vision for a, a more statewide career. So some, some fairly immediate needs that uh, we're looking for people who have deep interest in these areas to help us um, work through. When I talk about these core service committees, um, I, I wanna emphasize that unlike the NAC, which um, is appointed by the commission and, and has governing processes and bylaws and, and those kinds of needs. These core services committees are intended to be uh, much less formal, although I do want to emphasize that they all have real work. They will all have deliverables and expectations that we need to meet. But we really want to cast a wide net and encourage as much involvement in these committees as possible. And so we're not going to necessarily be appointing people to these committees. They're not going to have to serve for a particular period of time. Um, we're looking for volunteers who are subject matter experts in these areas and, and are willing to invest their knowledge and interest in these areas. We're also looking for people who um, might not necessarily have that deep subject matter expertise but have interest in these areas and want to participate and, and view this as an opportunity to learn more about these services and to improve their skills. The other thing that's important to, to know about these committees is that um, we're, we're talking about having um, people who come together on a regular basis to accomplish the work that needs to be accomplished but those committees will always be open. And so if um, it, it works more effectively for people to drop into those meetings 
that they can attend rather than having something that they have to regularly commit to and, and may only be able to participate infrequently, that's okay too. Again, we want to cast a wide net and be just as inclusive as possible. Uh, so Kara is going to be uh, drafting an email that we'll send to Wired to provide more information about these volunteer opportunities, the work that needs to be accomplished that I touched on briefly here today, and, and more information about how you can get involved. Um, and if you have interest in any of the things I just described, please let me or Kara know. We, we're, we would be really, really grateful for your involvement. And then uh, as we work to seat more core service committees in the coming months, there'll be a lot more opportunity for many, many more people to get involved. The other point I want to emphasize is that um, we want to encourage librarians from all types of libraries, not just public libraries, and this doesn't just have to be library directors. We really want to include library staff as well. Stop and ask if there's any questions there. A couple things coming in the chat. Will members of current standing committees, that is like the CMC, be required to submit an application? Um, so no application. We're not, we're not going to be that formal with any of these committees. Um, and, and yes, we would absolutely love for you to continue to participate. Um, uh, the CMC, the, the Content Management Committee, has direct parallels with um, some of the collection development work that we're talking about, as well as the, the need for cataloging around the state. And Beth says she'd really like to be posted, um, kept posted, and so there will be some opportunities. I did I did not post the link to the website. I'm not 100% sure it's been updated entirely to yeah. the membership. We're in the process of making a lot of uh, changes in our website, so I'll, I'll wait until um, I get that confirmed before I send that around. All in a little bit of transition, aren't we? We are. All right. Any more questions about MLN and a lot, a lot more to come. The other thing I wanted to just ask of all of you is if you have thoughts about core services. And when we talked to the Network Advisory Council, um, I, I said that in my mind, a core service are those services that directly impact our patrons. Um, that require a level of, of expertise from libraries and library staff. And so, you know, we've talked about things like the, the management platform for our libraries and cataloging and collection development, our e-resources and our, our resource sharing practices like interlibrary loan and the courier um, programming for a wide variety of different age groups. Uh, as I mentioned, um, someone recently suggested that we think about reference services. If there are services like that that uh, you think we haven't considered, um, let us know. You know, we, we really need to make sure that we're uh, taking your in, input and feedback when we think about how to structure these kinds of core services work. I just want to add that I, I think attending those meetings, just listening in is always really helpful to get your sense of where things are going in library services in Montana and, you know, what people are kind of stepping out to the forefront and what kinds of things might be scaling up statewide. And so I really do encourage people to um, just tune in to those meetings. They are public and we put them on Zoom so you can you can listen in. Thanks, Joe. I wanted to touch briefly on uh, the, the pandemic and some of the, the rapid shifts that are happening. Um, 
I mentioned the CDC yesterday lifting the mask mandates. So suggesting that people are no longer required to wear masks if they are fully vaccinated. And, and of course, being fully vaccinated means that you've had either one shot of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or two shots of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines and two weeks from your, your last shot considered fully vaccinated. Um, of course, there uh, are, are people who are not fully vaccinated and, and we should all be cognizant, I think, of um, our exposure to people who are not fully vaccinated. Uh, I know we at the State Library are going to be encouraging our staff to continue to wear masks when they're working in close contact with each other and with members of the public in case those people that we're working with are not fully vaccinated. We cannot, according to legislation that was passed this session, ask people about their vaccination status, nor can we prevent people from using the library if they are not vaccinated. Um, that, that is not allowed. The, the use of the, the vaccination passports is not allowable within our public services. So um, it, it's, a, it's a tricky place to be in. And um, it's hard to know how to proceed when you don't know someone's status. Uh, our HR person here reminded us to be kind and uh, non-judgmental when we are around people who may not be wearing masks because we don't know their vaccination status. And as I said, we can't ask. Um, we can just be really mindful and thoughtful of our own personal behaviors and practices and, and those of our staff. It's a, a difficult waters to navigate when we don't have very clear direction uh, other than we know now we cannot require masks and we cannot require the use of vaccination passports. Is there any questions or discussion? So I, I have a, this is Susie, and I have a question. So we adopted a reopening plan where we have a date where we're gonna stop requiring patrons to wear masks based on when we think all of our staff will be fully vaccinated. But we are getting pushback that people say that that's illegal. Um, but we came up with that plan in conjunction with our city county health department. Um, when did you come up with that plan, Susie? Um, well, it's been an ongoing piece of work, but we picked that date based on when vaccines were available to everybody. And then we went out like the latest that any of our staff could get it. And then we went out the six weeks. So by that date, all of our staff should be fully vaccinated. So I think we came up with that date probably eight weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I think your, your um, policy hinges on a mask requirement. You know, the, the governor has recently said that um, we can no longer require people to wear masks. So I think you would be safe in encouraging people to wear masks. And, you know, I think the argument that you're making about uh, when your staff are going to be fully vaccinated and protecting staff so that you can continue to uh, be open and available to provide services is, is a really, really important one. Um, I suspect if you checked with your attorney now uh, and your local health officials, they would tell you that you cannot require people to wear masks. So I've been looking for that. Do you have the link to where the governor said that? But I'll find that for you, Susie, and share that out. I don't have it immediately handy. It was within, was it a week or 10 days ago that he issued that? I'll look and see if I can find it too. And I can post it here. Okay. Other questions or discussion? As a subject matter, not 
discussed today, do you know when they're going to fix the link to submit our standards? Oh, that's a really good question. I, Pam, I know Pam's online. She might I know. will jump in and tell you that I don't know for sure. I know Tracy asked for some support and people have been a little bit busy with some other things too. So it will be soon, but I can't give you a definite time. Um, I was hoping this week so that next week you could submit them. Um, so yeah, I haven't heard. And she's at the Tamarack Federation this weekend too. So it will probably be next week and we will put something out on Wired for sure. Um, it's, you know, she put them out and then went on vacation. And it's like, we always know we shouldn't do this kind of thing and then have people go on vacation, but it happens. Um, so I don't know for sure, but just keep watching Wired. Thanks, Pam. Okay. Was Suzanne able to join us? Nope, I'm not seeing Suzanne. Okay. I think the gist of what she wanted to say is that there's a lot of broadband money out there. And um, in order to take advantage of some of it for affordable broadband, um, we may want to look at encouraging libraries to think about applying for E-rate. Um, so more to come on that topic. And I know that applying for E-rate has a lot of red flags that come along with it, uh, but there's some, some real positive financial benefits uh, in the trade-offs, so. Well, I have heard Suzanne say that you may never have applied to E-rate before, but you might want to reconsider that now, so. Exactly, exactly. So, more to come. Well, I do have an article in the, in the Great Falls um, Tribune about the GN40 nullifying mask mandates. Um, so I'll post that. Yeah, Beth posted it in the chat too, so. Oh, okay, great. Never mind. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. All right, other questions. Thanks for your question, Nancy. Does E-rate still require um, having, you have to have a filter? Yeah. I you don't know. To, yeah, you have to filter children's computers if you're using federal funds, any, any funds that, um, children would use. So if you have dedicated children's computers, those would have to be filtered. If you have um, public access, access computers that anyone uses of any age group, they would all have to be filtered. So that is one of the, that is one of the drawbacks. I think as soon as we know a little bit more, Suzanne and I have talked about getting her online to do a, some some uh, a, a meetup on on just on E-rate and stuff. There's a quite additional follow-up question: Is it mandatory to filter, or can it's a library offer offer the opportunity to filter? I've heard it's, both. It's, it's mandatory. It's mandatory. Um, I do know that the the filtering technology that exists is much better than it used to be. Um, so there's some different approaches that make filtering less problematic, but you know, there's definitely some, some people who um, kind of gulp and look the other way when it comes to filtering because it is a, it is a requirement. For example, with the hotspot lending program, um, those are funded through federal dollars. And technically the state library meets SIPA requirements because the, the state's network is already filtered. And so we, we worked with the, the Institute of Museum and Library Services to create a program where we own the hotspots and lend them to libraries to lend so that um, you as libraries don't have to filter them if you would prefer not to. Since you brought up hotspots, I this is Joe. I just want to let everybody know that the public service announcements promoting the hotspot pilot program um, across Montana are running right now on all the major TV stations. And 
if you would like um, to have that media to post to your Facebook or Twitter pages or Instagram, that's available. It's all in the public domain. You can post away. And we're just starting a little bit of work. We might be, somebody suggested radio PSAs and um, Jenny's kind of giving the go ahead on that. So we hope to have those, some audio PSAs available pretty soon too. Well, thanks for the great discussion today, everyone. Any any other topics people want to bring up? Can you hear me? Yeah. This is Kathleen. I'm letting you know I am retiring in October. Oh, when are you retiring? When did you say? October. Harlotin October. will okay. never be the same. Oh, oh, Kathleen. Well not. oh my gosh. Kathleen. That's what the mayor said too. Congratulations. <laughs> we will have to celebrate with you, Kathleen. Yeah. Well, and I, you almost made me swear because it has been my goal to get you in the shared catalog and you cannot, you cannot retire before you're in the shared catalog. Uh-huh, I can do. <laughs> Watch her. <laughs> Congratulations, Congratulations, Kathleen. Kathleen. But well, I may... see you sometime soon, yes. yes. I may want to work part-time. Okay. So I may be checking into something with the State Library. Well, there you go. Because it's like you guys have been my family for almost 23 years. It's going to be a busy year, Kathleen. So It is. Yeah. <laughs> but my library assistant isn't retiring till February. <sighs> and I had her do in our, um, she has the credentials for library administrator. Okay. I figured that one out ahead of time. Huh. That's a good plan. So, well, okay, um, Jenny, if we're all done, I'm going to make one announcement and then we'll stop. I just want to remind people that the registration is now open for the Public Library Directors Institute, which will be held um, starting August 30th, running through September 2nd at the Erline. Ursuline Center, sorry, in Great Falls, the retreat center there. And we have planned a really interesting mm -hmm. and fun agenda for you all. Um, Andrew Sanderbeck's going to be the facilitator. He let me know that um, he's actually going to bring along a second person. So we're going to cool. really um, have a, a really good discussion. I think we'll find the next great, big, wonderful, new collaborative thing for public libraries at that institute. So I hope you'll awesome. you'll plan to come and um, hope we'll all be, we'll, we will be uh, keeping safe and doing our best to, there's quite a few ac outdoor activities planned. That's why we picked um, a summertime um, place. So get on, get into Aspen and register. Um, we'd like to know who's coming. And just, uh... To let you know the next meeting of the State Library Commission is June 9th and those meetings are always available via Zoom uh, and announced uh, on WARD as well. So we always encourage you to attend those meetings. Uh, one of the topics for their June meeting is adoption of the FY22 plans of service and then we also anticipate that they will take action to move the revised public library standards into an administrative rules process. So a couple of topics that may be of interest to some of you. And with that, thanks, Jenny. I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording and we will stay online for the folks who are here if you have anything else you'd like to chat about. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, thanks everyone.